Good afternoon. Uh, in 2021, in this very summit, we kind of kicked off Next at Hyperscalers. Uh, we are following through on that uh, by announcing uh, FB NIC in this uh, forum, uh, the hardware and the software as well. I'm Joseph Provin uh, from Meta. And I'm Dave Fenson. I work at the Custom Compute Solutions uh, business unit at Marvell. So just to give you all a quick overview of uh, uh, FB NIC itself, it's a multi-host foundational NIC. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been uh, built for OCP 3.0 uh, TSF form factor. Um, we have built this to provide us full data path isolation for up to four hosts. Um, you know, it is a very simple design, uh, you know, mostly focused towards uh, the TCP IP web scale type um, uh, applications and services. Uh, we do have the BMC interface for manageability through the uh, OCP defined um, NCSI and MCTP standards, um, uh, or at least OCP uh, NIC specified uh, standards. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the key uh, features that we did uh, put into this is, uh, especially for the hyperscalers, is uh, line rate uh, PTP, uh, time, uh, at least uh, time stamping. Um, the other important thing that I wanted to also mention is that it, uh, we have initiated open sourcing our driver to the kernel.org, um, so it's available uh, for anyone who wants to look at it under uh, driver's meta. At the top level, uh, the NIC consists of four slices, where each slice is a distinct port. Um, so each slice contains its own 100 gigabit data path and associated management CPU. On the host side, uh, each slice has got its own independent uh, single function PCI Gen 5 by 4 interface. And on the Ethernet side, uh, there's port speeds of 25, 50, and 100 gig supported. Lane rates, so it's one or two lanes on that side, lane rates of 25 gig NRZ or 56 gig PAN4. Um, as Joseph mentioned, right, there's pros and cons to every architecture. Uh, one of the key uh, sort of uh, advantages of this architecture is that we have full independence across the different slices. So you can do a, a full hardware reset of a slice, take it down, you can provision different firmware in each slice or choose a different time to upgrade the firmware in each slice. And you know, if you're doing debug on one slice or have it in some sort of non-operational state, the other slices can be fully operational. Uh, we can choose to put it in a one, two, or four slice configuration just by programming the through EEPROM. So if a particular slice is not in use, it's just held and reset and its clocks are gated off right from the clock tree source. Across the bottom in the green, um, you can see there is a little bit of common logic. This is things like fuse arrays and system PLLs. Uh, and across the very bottom of the diagram, you've got the normal sort of grab bag of uh, low speed interfaces that most NICs have got, right? Some of these are provided on a per slice basis, such as uh, USB, QSPY, and SM bus. Some of them are shared across the slices, so RBT, I squared C, UART, uh, JTAG, these kinds of things. We dive down to the next level at the slice level. Um, I guess I'll focus across the green path to begin, the transmit path. Uh, the device has support for 256 host rings. By default, 128 of those are for traffic from the local server, and the other 128 are used for receive to transmit uh, um, forwarding using express data path. Um, the descriptors themselves have uh, eight byte subdescriptor granularity, so you can stack them together and get the uh, optimal use of the bus for short versus long frames or depending how much other metadata you need to pass along. Once the descriptors are on board, the frames are scheduled using a byte-aware deficit-weighted round robin, which is a sort of a standard NIC feature. There is an optional overlay, though, for earliest departure time scheduling. This is one where we pass down a timestamp in the descriptor, and it's compared against the local PTP timestamp reference to decide whether the frame is eligible to be scheduled. Um, after the frames have been DMA'd on board, the, you know, the capability set is exactly what you'd expect from something described as a foundational NIC. Um, protocol offloads center mostly around TCP IP and UDP IP, large send offload, and the associated checksum offloads. Uh, there's also a TCAM lookup that can be done on the L2 header at that time to decide whether or not the destination should be altered or expanded. Uh, three possible destinations here. Obviously, the network and the BMC are the first two, and then the onboard firmware would be the third. 
Um, fully assembled frames go into the transmit frame buffer, which is stored forward while waiting for the checksum calculations to be complete. Um, this is a 128 kilobyte buffer. It can be carved up, or uh, not dynamically, but uh, in a configurable way uh, with a bunch of different queues for the different destinations. And there's also an ingress path for frames coming in from the onboard firmware or from the BMC to get them out to the network. Um, frames head out from there, out to the, the Mac PS PCS and onto the network. PTP timestamping is done at that time. So as Joseph mentioned, I mean, the PTP timestamping is limited to two-step in this case, um, but it also can be used more generically just to actually measure when a transmit frame reached the wire relative to its scheduling time so you can tweak and audit the, uh, you know, how the, uh, the frames are being sent down through the, the rings. Uh, if we come back now on the yellow path across the top to the receive path, uh, received frames go through a uh, hardware parser. It's got some programmability to support uh, uh, VLAN tags and uh, MPLS labels, L3, L4 options, but generally speaking, it focuses on the most commonly used uh, networking protocols. Um, the fields are extracted from the headers and sent through a hierarchy of different TCAM lookups, eventually culminating in an action table lookup that decides the fate of the frame. And do we keep the frame? Do we drop the frame? and where is the frame going to go? So the destinations here in this case are the host, the BMC, the onboard firmware. Um, the other thing that gets decided at this point, obviously we decide the ring. The ring can come straight from the action table or it can come from the RSS lookup. Um, and uh, in fact, the scattering that's going to be applied to this particular packet is, is decided by the parser and carried through as well. From there, the frame is forwarded to a cut through uh, capable received frame buffer. This has got, similar to the transmit frame buffer, the ability to pick off packets on the BMC, the onboard firmware. Um, as the frames come out of there and head into the receive queue manager, uh, there is support for 128 receive rings, and there's a receive DMA engine that's quite flexible there with a variety of different header scattering modes and payload packing modes uh, you know, that are ultimately determined by the parser. On the left hand of the diagram, you've got a management CPU. This is a three-stage CPU that's got support for a fundamental chip management, uh, you know, trusted boot, and then you know, actual mission mode uh, image. Um, and the management CPU, the, the queue managers, and the PCI bus are all held together by a you know, small network on chip. If we look at the back end implementation here. It's a die plot there. It's uh, fairly intuitive. The slices uh, go sort of left to right, right? So it doesn't take a whole lot to pick out where the, uh, the PCI CERTES are on the left. You can see the four of them down the left-hand side. The Ethernet's on the right-hand side. Uh, you know, USB 5s are in the upper right corner. Across the bottom, all the little sticks are just the low-speed I.O. Uh, I.O. packs. Um, Overall, it was, it was done in a five nanometer process using 14 metal layers, and the total ASIC area came in just uh, shy of 38 square millimeters. Um, the, the primary clocks are very benign for a five nanometer process at only 800, 600, 500 megahertz, about 16 megabytes of internal SRAM, and the whole chip was placed into a 23 millimeter by 23 millimeter package, uh, flip chip ball grid array. Um, in terms of power numbers, uh, you know, worst case power numbers, uh, you know, as opposed to typical, would be around seven and a half watts for um, for a two by fifty gig mode, and you know, twelve and a half watts for four by hundred gig mode. The power numbers are competitive. I mean, I'm just giving the, the more worst case numbers in this case. Um, in terms of the the module. Uh, there's been a couple different boards that have been designed with this chip. One was an eval board. A lot of work has gone into that in the last year where we've been using all the extra debug features that are an eval board. Uh, but the main target is an OCP NIC 3.0 compliant board. And if you want to go see it uh, in the innovation village uh, over in that corner there, there is a, uh, um, an FB NIC display and they have a delitted um, um, or, or a module that's got a deleted uh, chip on there so you can actually see the package versus the chip size if you'd like. Uh, so the initial focus on this is on uh, two slice uh, TSFF. Uh, we're targeting the Yosemite V4 platform. Uh, this, this card is now production ready. It has passed all the regulatory and safety checks and is ready to go. Uh, just just uh, one more point is that in our, the Innovation Village, we also have a live demo of uh, the FBNIC uh, so feel free to stop by. Uh, as for Yosemite V4, if you stop by Mattis booth, 
Uh, you will see a Yosemite V4 chassis as well on the bottom. You will see the you know the, the place where we'll probably put the uh, uh, terminus Nexus, uh, sorry, FB NIC as well. Uh, um, in terms of the uh, uh, driver, uh, you know, we did uh, upstream, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you might have heard uh, presentations on uh, uh, FBNIC driver if you have been at uh, NetDev this year earlier, um, as well as you know, on other uh, Linux meetings. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to pro provide some highlights uh, of the driver itself. You know, we do use uh, DevLink for health reports. Uh, we have a debugfs interface. Uh, and uh, you know we do have uh, the page splitting with the header data split, and we have separate uh, uh, assist from the hardware for this as well. Um, and as uh, Dave mentioned, you know we do have uh, inherent congestion control through ECN for the RX 5Os, and also early departure time for the TXQs. Uh, we have uh, made a very generic software-based offloads because there are a lot of hardware assist for some of these offloads. Uh, we do timestamp uh, RX and TX packets at line rate. Uh, and then the uh, uh, driver has been available uh, starting from release uh, 6.11. And, and again, you know, at kernel.org, you can uh, see the source code under uh, drivers matter in the, in the net uh, uh, tree. So uh, in, in closing, uh, we, as part of this, you know, we have contributed FB NIC uh, to OCP. Uh, the FB NIC driver has, uh, it will start uh, being available to Linux releases. We'll continue to update uh, the drivers you know, as we uh, go through the normal cycle. Uh, you know, we, we would like everyone to uh, you know, contribute hardware and software to the OCP NIC activities, just, just as what we have. Uh, for FB NIC itself, you know, I have the contact name. Uh, you know, please, please feel free to reach out. And, and the in intent is for us to announce at OCP so we can build a community here. Um, and then, you know, we also have uh, uh, Jacob's name here, and you, some of you might see him, uh, you know, frequently at uh, Linux meetings, so that's another avenue to contact us. Uh, there are some additional information in terms of how to get uh, involved. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.